We have groups every week, and these are small groups that are designed to help you have community, relationships, to develop new friendships, to uh, experience the Lord himself. And um, we've just been having an amazing time. Um, We have three groups uh, that meet during the week. We have one right after the service that is online by Angelita Giles does that group. So if you are not comfortable meeting in person in a group, uh, you could join Angelita's group. Um, We also have a group from Matt and Becca, and that is on Monday nights at 630. And you guys are meeting where right now? Here at the church, okay. 6.30-ish on Monday nights here at the church. Very powerful. Um, Philip and I are doing a group on Sunday nights at 5 here at the church. And um, we've got some fairly new people in there also. So uh, if you have not joined a group, I really encourage you, I really encourage you to do that because... um, When you connect with people um, and you develop friendships and develop godly connections, um, there's just some synergy that uh, can't really be explained, but you grow. You just grow. And so I really encourage you to do that. On to other things. We have some really cool things coming up. Um, The next two Saturdays, we have a prophetic art class. Yes. On a Saturday morning, would you come up here, Michaela, and tell us about it? Um, If you haven't been part of her prophetic art classes, wow. I'm just going to say, if you have any expectation, God will blow your mind. I'm going to let her tell you. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I am just so excited. Um, to be able to come back and offer um, some more prophetic art experiences with you. Um, Basically, Holy Spirit is just like, hey, facilitate an environment where people are welcome to experience me in a way that they haven't before. And that's what this is about. So there is no, I have to be an artist. You already are. Spoiler alert, just so you know. Um, You are creative just inherently by being created by the creator. It is your inheritance to be creative. And so this experience um, is really, really precious. You just come in, we give time for the Holy Spirit, and he is going to reveal to you what you are going to create into your life. So it'll be here at the church. We have two classes. One is this Saturday at 9 a.m. And then the other one will be next Saturday the 13th at 9 a.m. And we will meet over in the little coffee center. And there is a sign up, yes. Um, That way I do have your name and number and can contact you throughout the week letting you know, hey, we have this thing. I'm looking forward to seeing you. So be sure to catch out that sheet up in the Welcome Center, and I can't wait to see you guys there. Thanks. Yeah. So, so good. Sign up out here. Don't forget to sign up. If you have never done art, I, I was not a, a real artist, I'm, I'm telling you. I know I'm artistic, but I'm not an artist. And I went to her class, and God just wrecked me. And Pastor Terry can attest to the same. Same thing happened with him. Amazing. All right. We also have some more exciting news. Next Sunday, next Sunday, we are having Wayne Drain join us. Yes, it'll be so amazing. If you have not heard Wayne, um, first of all, he has a beautiful father's heart uh, and just so, so powerful. But also he operates in the prophetic in um, uh, really extraordinary ways. Um, Anything else? Did I miss anything? I don't think so. I love you guys. Have a great day. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Sherry. (laughs) Hallelujah. Was everybody blessed today? Oh, we're blessed to have you. And really, truly, next, uh, next Sunday, and I want to speak to everyone who's watching on social media. Also, don't miss Pastor Wayne Drain. Uh, very prophetic. This happened, uh, gosh, about 
let's see, my granddaughter will be three in March. So it happened about three and a half, four years ago that uh, my daughter was believing God for children. There were complications. She was on fertility pills and they were doing everything they could. And she was so broken that she had finally just completely given up. And her and her husband said, okay, we're going to do this one more time and that's it. And um, Wayne was ministering in the service and he did not know my daughter. And he picked her out and he said, stand up. The Lord gave me a word for you and said, and this was in January. He said, come in July. I see it's like the 4th of July for you. It's like the fireworks just going off. Whatever you've been believing for, you are going to be jumping all over the place. It was really a beautiful word. Well, in July, she got pregnant. And it was fireworks. And now, now it's really fireworks. Little Mercy running around. Gosh, you be, have to be careful what you say around those kids. How I many you know that? They will repeat everything. So, But uh, she is a sweetheart, me and her. She, it is, Kim is Coco and I'm Pops. So it's Coco Pops. So, and oh my goodness, she loves Coco, but she loves me when Coco's not around. So I told McCall, I said, now here's the deal with me. Number one, she gets everything she wants. She wants ice cream, how much? She wants popcorn, it's got to be kettle corn. How much kettle corn? I said, I do not spank. I do not, I, I gave them my whole list of rules. So when I keep her, it's whatever the kid wants. So she loves me. I just want y'all to know that. And, and then she will fall in the floor when she has to leave. But what are grandparents for? I mean, come on. That's why they always say you should have had your grandkids first. But it uh, doesn't really work that way. But anyway, God is good. So don't miss next Sunday. Uh, he, God will really use Wayne. He's an incredible man of God. We love him. All right, ushers, I want you to come. Uh, and we're going to receive the offering. If you're wondering where my wife is, Kim. Kim is visiting her aunt in Tulsa. Uh, there's two sisters that are alive on her mother's side, Aunt Sue and Aunt Dale. And Dale's in her 80s and has been very sick, but she's starting to come out of it. So Kim took this weekend to go up and her and Sue are with her and just ministering to her. So that's where she is. She'll be back in the morning. And so just to let you know that. Jesus had so many people in the book of John. Uh, this is chapter 6. He had so many people following him. And so there were thousands. And we know that he fed 5,000 men. And that's 5,000 men, not counting their families. So that, that's a lot of people. So he turns around to Philip and he says, look at all these people. Now how are we going to feed them all? And Philip's like, you got to be kidding me. And so Philip said this, and he answered, he said, well, I suppose if we were to give everyone just a snack, it would cost thousands of dollars to buy enough food. But just then, Andrew, Peter's brother, spoke up and said, hey, Jesus, look, here's a young person with five barley loaves and two small fish. Now, that's nothing more than fish and chips. That's all they had. But how far would that go with this huge crowd? I mean, he's looking at this so small, and he's looking at the crowd and said, this makes no sense, but this is the only thing we got. Jesus said, have everybody sit down. So the disciples had everybody sit down. Jesus said to his disciples, uh, put them on a grassy slope. More than 5,000 hungry people sat down, which really was around 15,000. And Jesus then took the barley loaves and the fish, and what did he do? He gave thanks to God. It doesn't matter how small your offering is. It's how big your heart is when you give it. And he gave thanks. He took that and he lifted it up to his father and he gave thanks. There's nothing more important than when we receive an offering or we're giving an offering 
that we always give thanks to God. Many of you may have needs, and I am sure those who are watching this morning, you have needs in your life, and you're wondering how on earth. Well, if you'll take what you have, and if all it is is just fish and chips, and maybe that's all you can afford, well, instead of buying it for yourself, buy it for someone else. Sow it as a seed to meet that need. Give God something to work with. And that's all Jesus needs is that something to work with. And then once you put it into his hands, notice what happens. After he gave thanks, then he gave to his disciples to distribute it to the people. So he had all his disciples come up and he began to break it off. He didn't break the food off individually for them. He just broke it off and handed it to them in baskets. And I'm sure when they looked down, all they saw was just, think about it, fish, fish and bread broken up into 12 pieces. So there probably wasn't even, you're talking just uh, uh, maybe an inch or so of fish and just a little crumbs of bread. And so Jesus brings them together. Now we've already thanked God for it. Now go feed the people. And they're going, and I, you know they were going, here. They were afraid to look. All of a sudden the baskets start getting heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. And so they're toting going, now this is wild. This is the wildest thing. And they watch the multiplication take place. When we give thanks to our giving, watch what God will do. And I want to say this to you prophetically by the Holy Ghost. It is time for multiplication in our giving. It's time for God to show up in every area of our life. And he is. He's going to multiply. He won't just multiply with what you have. He'll give you creative ideas, ways to create wealth in your life. He gives us the power to get wealth. So just start thanking him. But more than anything, like today, I got ready for the offering. I give my tithes. I've already given my, my offerings and certain things that I do to ministry or to the poor. But today I told the Lord, I said, you know what? I was reading this. I said, I'm bringing you a thank you offering. I'm bringing an offering just from Kim and I to say thanks to you. Thank you for blessing me. Now, I don't have to, I don't have to worry about this. You know why? Because God knows how to multiply. Yes. He knows how to multiply, not so I can go get me all kind of new things and all that. And that's cool. God could care less what you drive. Come on. You know, when he travels, it's by the speed of thought. So your fast car, he go for it. It doesn't make any difference. It's not about that. But it's about what we have in our hearts. But I'll tell you one thing. If there's lack in your life, he didn't design you to have lack. He designed you to have plenty and more than enough. And so if he'll do it for them, he'll do it for you. Amen. And miraculously, the food began to multiply. Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak multiplication upon this offering. I speak multiplication in the lives of people. As we honor you, and it's all about honoring you, and we give out of what we have. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, letting this be just a revelation in the heart of people in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if you need an envelope, raise your hand. Ushers have envelopes for you. If you're making out a check, make it out to Impact Church. Give online. That is impactarkansas.com. And I want to thank everyone who gives online, especially those who are watching today. And uh, I just speak God's blessing over you. All right, let's everybody stand up. And this is what we do uh, in our church. I've had people ask me, why do you do this? It's because of this very reason. We're going to give our offerings to him and we're going to give him thanks. We're going to do just what Jesus. So if you give through your phone or if you have a check or you give in an envelope, let's lift it up. Father, we thank you. What a privilege it is and an honor to you to give you thanks. And I thank you, you will show yourself strong to this church and to uh, this generation. And I thank you for the power to multiply, Jesus. And we just give you the praise. We love you so much. And we thank you for the privilege of sowing into your kingdom. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and wait.
on the people. If you got your Bibles, let's go ahead and let's turn back. We've been looking at this for three weeks here, and this is the last week we'll be touching on these scriptures, but Matthew chapter 9, and uh, we're looking at verse number 36. We've talked about several words. We're going to talk about real quick. We're going to just go back real quick, look at compassion, look at thrust, and we're going to look at uh, authority. We're going to look at these words. So everybody say compassion, yes. thrust, yes. and authority. Okay. Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells deep on the inside of us. Open this, our understanding now to the revelation of your word. I pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation to be released in, in our lives. Give us revelation of who we are in Christ and what we have. When he saw the vast crowds of the people, Jesus' heart was deeply moved with compassion because they've seemed weary and helpless and wandering sheep without a shepherd. The word compassion literally means in the Greek to be moved as to one's bowels. Hence, to be moved with compassion, to have compassion for the bowels were thought to be the seat of love and of pity. So, when, when Jesus was moved with compassion, he felt it on the inside. He literally, one translation says, his heart broke for the people. Well, you know, God is a spirit, but do you know that he has a heart? He has a heart. The Bible says this about that David was a man after God's own what? His own heart. So he has feelings. He has, he has, he has a heart. Jesus has a heart. Sometimes we don't see Jesus breaking for his people and his compassion. But I want you to know that the Lord, the greatest revelation that, that our, our, and what God wants to reveal so strongly about Jesus and in our lives is the fact that he loves us unconditionally. And that he loves you as much as he loves Jesus Christ. And that is hard to fathom. But in John 17, he makes it very clear. Father, show them that you love me you love them as much as you love me. Now that's one of those scriptures you just, you just have to look at for a while and take into your heart that but you put Jesus and me uh, beside each other and, and, and you, put, uh, you, you put Liana up here and we ask Jesus, uh, ask the Father, who do you love the most? And he could say, I love you all the same. And that revelation is incredible. And this is what has to be so deep in you as the Father's affection toward you and your right and your privilege to crawl up in his lap and to say Abba Father which is like Daddy. Uh, Mercy's the cutest thing after she has her nap. She gets up out of the bed by herself and she opens the door. She comes straight to me and you know what her first words are to me? Always. Hold me. Hold me. Hold me. And I pick her up and I put her in my arms and she lays her head right there on my shoulder. If we can understand how much parents and grandparents love their children, but there is nothing greater than to have that response of a child to say, hold me. And you know the father's response he picks you up and pulls you to himself. This scripture has meant so much to me in Psalms 139, verse 18. Every single moment you are thinking of me. Everybody say that. Every single moment you are thinking of me. Right now at 1102, January 31st. Right here, 2021, this very moment, God is thinking about you. He's thinking about you. Every now and then I'll wake up in the morning praying for the congregation and someone comes in my heart, call them. And I'll call them on the phone and I'll say, I was thinking about you this morning. The Lord brought, me, brought you up to me. And I want to tell you, but I don't do that every day. I don't do it every two seconds. 
Y'all would say, please leave me alone. (laughs) But you know the Father? Every moment. So it is unscriptural to say, oh, Father, please be with me. That's unscriptural. How can he not be with you? Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. No matter what you're going through, no matter where your family tree is or what's going on in your life, the Father, this very moment, is thinking about you. So I sat there one day and I thought, okay, that's cool. You right now are thinking about me. So I said, well, I'd just like to know what you're thinking about me. Are you thinking good? Or is it, what are your thoughts toward me? And I actually said that. And immediately, Scripture came to me. Here it is. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. No one knows his thoughts better than himself. And here are the thoughts that I'm thinking toward you right now at this very moment, says, says the Lord, thoughts of peace. Now, if we just stop right there, that is really cool. But I put in parentheses the Hebrew word for peace. Because in the Hebrew, when you study, also in the Greek, that's the beautiful part about those languages. When you study these words, a wealth of revelation comes alive. Because it's not just like me saying, well, peace be upon you. You go, yeah, well, thank you. You know, no, when God says, I'm thinking thoughts of peace, here it is. Welfare, health, prosperity, quiet. That word quiet should go with tranquility. Quiet tranquility. Contentment. Friendship of human relationships. With God, especially in covenant relationship. Listen to this. His thoughts toward you right now, at this very moment, is to give you welfare, health, to give you prosperity, to give you a quiet tranquility that you're not disturbed with what's going on in your life or disturbed with what is happening in this world. Who are we listening to? Let's listen to our Father. Build your life around the Word. This this is what He thinks. Matter of fact, He's thinking that about you right now. He loves you so much. Before you get out the door, He's thinking that way. At lunch today, He's thinking that way. How can I bless Him? I'm speaking health. Now, what we need to do is stop asking for all this and just believe, receive, and release. Say it with me. Believe, Believe. receive, and release. I told the Lord, after I read that, I said, okay, I'm chilling. That's cool. So, all I got to do is just ask you to go ahead and fulfill what you're thinking. And I just receive it. By faith, I receive it. This is all grace. All this is in the new covenant. In fact, it's even better than the old covenant. The new covenant, because of Jesus... We have to, what we do is we believe, we receive. It's the finished work of Christ, but it's done. This is what he thinks about you. Now, you can take that home, put it it up on your wall, put it somewhere, meditate in this, take a picture of it, go back, get the notes, whatever it takes, and every day you can get up and you can say, Father, thank you that this moment you are thinking of health in me. And so health belongs to me. Prosperity belongs to me right now. Not tomorrow. The problem, you know, I I was raised in the Assemblies of God, which is a Pentecostal movement. It's great foundation. I went from there really in the Word of Faith for years, for 23 years, and and the the Word of Faith around Kenneth Hagin and, and others, and I received so much from there. But what happened is faith, became something that we look for to happen in the future. And that is not faith. Faith is simply receiving what grace has already provided. It's simply appropriating what grace has done. And you say, well, Pastor Terry, can you give me a really good definition of grace? Yes, and it's so simple. His name is Jesus. And if Jesus 
healed the sick, ministered. He's here to touch you. He's already done it through his blood. Now, the next word is thrust. When he saw the vast people, he was moved with compassion. Then it says in verse 37, he turned to his disciples and said, the harvest is huge and it's ripe. He was talking about people. He's not talking about wheat or corn. He's talking about people. He said they're ripe, but there are not enough harvesters to bring it all in. And he said, so as you go, plead, yearn, or long for the owner of the harvest. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you God owns the people. He loves you. And he loves everything he created. There's no question. But the thing he loves, you are his pride and his joy. To the point, the Bible is very clear. Once, we, once he returns to the earth and we go through a, a millennium, which is a thousand years with him, he is literally after the white throne judgment when, when all the dead are going to stand before him. Now, great news for all of us. As a born-again believer, you're not going before the white throne judgment. You are going before the judgment seat of Christ. You don't want to be before the white throne judgment. No, no, no. And he will sentence people according to their works. And he will sentence the devil and everybody else. I mean, it's over. And they're cast. Now, it is Bible. And people don't like the Bible sometimes. And I've read, well, well, you know, when, when, when Jesus talks about being cast into a lake of fire or cast into that where there's torment forever, well, that's not really what that means. Well, guys, I wouldn't bet on it. I would not bet on that. I mean, it's pretty plain. In fact, it's all through the scripture. There is a judgment. But we will not be judged for our sins. You'll not be judged for your mistakes. You'll be judged for your works and what you did through the love of Jesus Christ to touch people. Because your sins are forgiven. You're as forgiven as Jesus himself. Matter of fact, you're as righteous as Jesus. And people, oh, their brain goes tilt. You can't say that. Oh, yes, I can. Hallelujah. Because I didn't say it. The Bible says it. All I have to do is believe and receive it and begin to know that my sins are as cast away as far as the east is from the west. It, the blood of Jesus calls. He looks at us and says, forgiven, clean, cleanse. You're not guilty any longer. And you have to understand this and know that it is in your spirit. You are free. So he said to pray that they thrust, be thrusted, be thrusted out. Pray that God thrust. Now, what we need right now is for the church to feel a good thrust. I mean, you know, that word li literally means to drive out. Almost to the same word that Jesus drove out the money changers. Grabbed a whip. The love of God manifested in the flesh. Whipped people right out of church. How would you like to have been the door greeter that morning? <laughs> Think about it. The love of God did that. God so loves us, he wants to explode. There's an explosion of his love. Revival and awakening comes to the church when there is such an explosion of God, an encounter of God, that it just burst into your emotions, burst into your thought life, burst into your mind, burst into your body where you feel the tangible presence, the manifested presence of the Holy Ghost in your life, and there's nothing on the planet that can compare to it. To where it's like, I got to get my hands on somebody. I got to pray for somebody. And instead of going, being intimidated by what's happening in the world, there is a boldness that comes upon you. Jesus made this statement, such a powerful statement in John 7, 37. Then, then on the most important day of the feast, the last day, Jesus stood and shouted out to the crowds. Now, you will only find two instances that Jesus shouted. And it's hard to imagine that he shouted, but he shouted. 
And when someone shouts, how many know that means it's important? And I don't know if he told his disciples, come here and put me on this rock. Get up here. Put me right up here. And here's all these people. They're all looking at him. And he takes his hands and he shouts. And he says, oh, you who are thirsty, come to me. Come to me and take a drink. Believe in me that rivers of living water are going to burst out from within you. Oh, hallelujah, Pastor Terry. Flowing from your innermost being, like the scripture says. God could only come down on the Old Testament believers. But in the New Testament, it starts in here. It is Christ in you. And the Holy Ghost, rivers, rivers, wants to burst, burst. And whatever healing, deliverance, it's all in the river. And it wants to explode through you. Man. Now when, I, when I read that, I think of what happened to, to Saul, who was the first king of Israel. And over in 1 Samuel chapter 10, uh, God told Samuel, go anoint him as the king. And, 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 and Samuel obeys the Lord. He goes and pours oil all of, over Saul's head and says, you are the new king of Israel. And Saul said, you, you don't have a clue. You have missed that, missed this. I don't know about all this oil. I don't know what all this means, but I'm from a little low tribe of Benjamin. I am the least. I am nothing. I can't, there's no way I can do this. Samuel looked at him and said, tomorrow, you're going to be headed back to your father's house. And you're going to run into some worshipers. And when you get in the middle of those worshipers, you're going to be changed, transformed to another person. And that's exactly what happened. When you say, Pastor Terry, how can I start releasing? Go get around some worshipers. I'm telling you. Go get around people who worship God. Get up here on Wednesday night, 630. Come in here and start worshiping. Just walk around in your home. Put some good worship music. Listen, we, we walk by faith and not by sight. And there are times in my life that I, that I know that the Lord, and the Lord does this for us to teach us. That it's almost like, you know, God, I know you're here, but I know you're here by faith because I sure don't feel a thing. But we're not moved by what we feel. We're moved by what the word says. So I know the Lord's there. But I can tell you what, I know how to get him stirred. I know how to stir my spirit. I'll put on worship music. I'll come up here to the church. I'll turn it up so, black, so loud they probably hear it at sounds. And I, I, I mean, I'm going to get it in me. And I'm, I, I know because something is thoughts or whatever is coming to my mind or, or, or fear or whatever. And I go, no, this is not going to happen. And I'll go through this church lifting my hands and I'll say, I glorify your name. You say, why do you do that? Not, it's not based on works or me trying to get God to do anything. It's the fact that he's worthy. He is worthy. It's not based on feelings. He's worthy of our praise. And there is a veil. There's a veil right now between us. There's a veil that if the Holy Spirit opened the veil, you would see multitudes, millions of angels all ready to minister to you. The Holy Spirit here, the manifested presence of God, and it's all on the inside of you. It's all in there. Oh, I just need God to move. Yes, but we need him to move in us. I'm not looking just for something to come from down. I'm looking for what's already in me. There are rivers in there. Healing, deliverance. And it's not just to touch you, it's to touch others. Amen. To minister to others. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Believe, receive, release. And the faith message, we're always taught to believe and receive. Now it's time to release it. I believe I receive it and I release it. I release health through my body. I release peace into my thought life. I don't need to pray and ask Jesus for peace. 
Why? Because John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. So it's unscriptural for me to pray for peace. No, I've already got peace. I have his peace. What I need to do is believe and receive and then out of my mouth say, Father, I release the peace of Jesus Christ into my thought life and into my feelings and into my emotions and you be calm in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for peace. Thank you for it, Father. Thank you for what Jesus did. He died for me, the finished work of Christ. Now, authority. I don't think there's any stronger word than authority for, the, for us right now. What he did, the Bible says, he said, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Then he called all his disciples together, all of them. And Jesus gathered his 12 disciples in Matthew 10, 1, and imparted to them authority, notice this, to do what? Cast out demons, heal every sickness and every disease. This is the Greek word for authority. It is the power of rule or government. The power of him whose will and commands must be submitted to by others and obeyed. That is the Greek word for authority. When Jesus pulled them up, and leave that up there, it wasn't authority over Rome. What was it? It was authority over every devil they ran against. Cast it out. He didn't say pray to cast it out. He said cast it out. Get rid of it. Tell it to go. Use my name and tell it to go. I have delegated my authority to you. This is the government of the kingdom. The government of the kingdom in the spirit is over anything. Everything has to bow. And he said, and it has to be obeyed. Use my name, go out there and heal every sickness and disease. Now, everybody listen to me. If it is God's will to use sickness and disease to teach us something, and why in the world did Jesus give them authority to cast it out? The theology doesn't, doesn't work. See, Jesus is perfect theology. And you say, Pastor Terry, that's a big word, theology. Now nah, it's simple. It's just the study and nature of God. That's all it is. If you want to study how the Father thinks, study Jesus. No place did Jesus ever reject anybody. No, sickness and disease is not a part of living for, for God. It, his healing power is in us. Now, do people get sick? Absolutely. Have I been sick? Sure. Gone through cancer, gone through several things. But here is the truth. Himself took my infirmities and bore my sicknesses and by his stripes, I am healed. Not going to be healed. I am healed now. That has to do with the understanding of spirit, soul, and body. Now, I'm going to show you a scripture and this is one you'll have to take home, you'll have to look at, and you'll have to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you. But this is what Paul said in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, and this is how they amplified. For in him the whole fullness of deity, the Godhead, continues to dwell in bodily form, giving complete expression of the divine nature. Now, we don't have a problem with that. Here is Jesus. The fullness of the deity, the Godhead, continues to dwell in bodily form. Now, Jesus is in a body. He has a body just like this. Now, it's glorified. Do you know that Jesus will be the only body in heaven that will have, will have scars? Your new body will not have a scar. But Jesus's will have scars. He told Thomas, put your, your hand in the middle of my nail print. Pull up and put your hand in my side. He's the only body that will be scarred. But Jesus is in a body. He's the firstborn from the dead. You know what? We're going to get one just like his, but it's going to be pure and beautiful. No wrinkles. Brand spanking new. I mean, an eternal body 
to live with him forever, be able to do everything he, he did, total, complete revelation and understanding. But you'll never, ever see, we'll, we'll search throughout eternity to see the depthness of God. You'll never get complete revelation of him because he's too big. I heard somebody say this, and I believe it's true. They were praying about these angels circling the throne, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and which is to come. And he said the Holy Spirit just spoke to him. And the, these angels are, ch are cherubims. They have eyes. They're full of eyes. They must be some kind of creature to behold. But their eyes are moving constantly as they circle the throne. And every time they circle the throne, they see a new aspect of the Father. And all they can do is cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But they don't get to crawl up in his lap. We do. And we don't have to wait till we get to heaven in our spirits. He said, come boldly. Hebrews 4 verse uh, 16, come boldly into the throne room of grace to receive mercy and find help in the time of need. We come boldly. That means pull up in his living room. Get in his living room. Start loving on him. And all of a sudden, something's going to start stirring in you. Why? Because it's the Spirit of God that's within you. And it wants to express itself through your feelings, through your emotions. And control your life. Jason, can I borrow your coat real quick? Here's the understanding we have to see. 1 Thessalonians, and I, now let me, let me do this. I ain't finished here. Watch this. So we're all cool about Jesus. But notice the next part. And you are in him, made full and having come to the fullness of life in Christ, you too are filled with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And reach full spiritual stature. And he is the head of all rule and authority of ever angelic principality and power. In you right now as a believer dwells the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You can't get any more of him because he's already there. The spirit is the third part of you. It's the main you. It's your identity. You know, when you look at that scripture, that almost, and there's a lot of theologians that really will choke over it. Well, that, that's just talking about when you get to heaven. No, that's talking about right now. You're in Christ. Christ is in you. You've been made full. In Christ, you are filled. Now, what's, what's this referring to? It's the understanding of spirit, soul, and body. The Bible is very, very clear. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and I read this not to the, the other Sunday. Now, now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. Your whole spirit, your soul, and your body be kept blameless to the, to the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, man is a spirit, he has a soul, and he lives in a body. We are a three-part being. The real you is the spirit. It's the, it's the man you can't see, but he's there. In him, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost dwells. Oh, Pastor Terry, I'm just praying to be an overcomer. You can't be any more of an overcomer than that. What we need to pray is, God, give me a revelation of what's on the inside of me. That's the prayer. Because what happens, and here's where most people live, and I'll use this as a veil. The spirit's right here, the soul's here, and here's the body. And we live our life with this veil, never looking at who we really are. And so we live out of what? Out of our emotions. Oh, my life's just falling apart. I just don't understand what I'm going through. And, and, and I understand that. There's horrible things that have happened to people in the soul. Abuse. And Kim and I have ministered to many a people. 
But I, I'm telling what the Holy Spirit's going to do in these last days. He's pulling off the veil. And instead of this right here, and it's so simple. If I live out of soul and body, two against one, they win. But if I live soul and spirit, two against one, we win. And the Holy Spirit is in you. Everything you'll ever need, it's already in there. What we need to do is begin to look at these scriptures and begin to say, God lives in me. God lives in me. Say this after me. God lives in me. Now, you're not a heretic for saying that. Though people say, oh, Pastor Terry, you can't teach that. I didn't, I didn't write it. It's my job to believe it. And what it has done in my own life. And it's changed the way I think. I am thanking him. Father, you live in me, in my spirit. Now the spirit has to be fed. And it's got to be fed on the word. Our generation knows very little about the Bible. And the spirit of God, I'm telling you, if you don't have the word on the inside of you, you're going to fail. This revelation of authority of the believer I can, it changed my life. Uh, I was, gosh, I was, I had just turned 17. So I was in the summer of my, my senior year. I went to church camp every year. I'd, I'd have an experience with the Lord. I'd go back to school and I was good for two weeks. And I was back just as bad as I was. And I remember by the time I hit 16, I knew I had a call of God on my life, but I was so frustrated one day, I just told God, I said, you can't live for you in high school. It just doesn't work. There, there's, it just can't, doesn't work. And the Jesus movement broke out 69, 70, 71, 72, and it was uh, 1973 in the summer that it came to visit Magnolia, Arkansas, where I was raised. Three of our friends, they were all... Uh, freshman in college, took the summer from Russellville, Arkansas. Wayne Drain was a part of this group. But he did, he did, I didn't meet him until years later, really about five years ago. But I knew all these guys from Russellville. Well, they just showed up at our house in a Volkswagen bus. And, and of course, in the, come on guys, in the, in the, 70s, the hair was down to the middle of the back. I used to say that, that, that I used to tell people, you'll never see my ears again. I mean, that's just the way it was. And so these long-haired guys, and, but they're friends of ours. They just showed up unannounced and just knocking on the door. And our, we had a lady that cleaned our house. She called the shoe store we were at and said, there's, and I was on the phone and they said, she said, Mr. Terry, there's three friends of y'all's that they're here. And she said, I think they're all preachers. And I laughed. I said, I ain't got a friend on the planet that's a preacher. And, and so finally I said, what are their names? Put one of them on the phone. And one of them got on the phone and I was like, you got to be kidding me. So we get off work and my twin brother and I and my older brother Randy, and we all go home and lo and behold, they were, they had come unglued for Jesus. They were radical. I mean, completely radical. And in those days, kids hung out in the parking lots. That's what we did. I mean, we only had a Sonic. We didn't have a Taco Bell. We didn't have a McDonald's, but bless God, we had a Sonic. So every night, a Friday night, they just circled the Sonic. And then they'd end up in this huge parking lot. You're talking about 75 to 100 kids from high school. And so they just grab us and say, we're going witnessing. I'm going, oh, Jesus, help me, Lord. I hadn't prayed in a while, but give me grace. And they, they, just, they just blasted the parking lot, telling everybody about Jesus. You know, you can clear a parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> but I sit and my insides were about to burst. Because I knew, God, I got to have what they got. 
And finally, they said to me, where's your pastor live? I mean, this is around 10 o'clock. I said, well, he lives over by the church. He said, call him up. Tell him we're coming over. And I called. And I said, Pastor Shumway, this is Terry. And he goes, oh, yeah. Are you still up? He goes, sure. I said, can you meet some friends of ours? He goes, absolutely. So at 10 o'clock, we go in his house. And they just start telling him all the testimonies of what God was doing in Russellville. And the Spirit of God was just sweeping through that college, Russellville Tech. And everywhere they go, they're just ministering to people, getting kids saved and this and that. And again, I thought my heart was going to burst. And then Pastor Shumway said, I just feel like we need to pray. And I laid on that floor and I broke. Man, I wept. I wept. They laid hands on me. They ministered to me. They ministered to my older, bro- uh, my older brother, my twin brother. When he, when he saw him, he ran. He just took off. He got it later. But I'm telling you, when I got up, I felt a change. I felt something different. But I thought, now how am I going to go into my high school year with this same anointing? And then someone sat me down and began to speak to me out of Ephesians 2 verse 6. And he raised us up together with him and made us to sit down together, giving us joint seating with him in the heavenly sphere by virtue of our being in Christ Jesus the Messiah, the anointed one. And that word changed my life. I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. Therefore, I can walk into my high school with the glory of God in my life by revelation of the word because me and Jesus are one. And I'd never seen that. And I'm telling you, that's what happened. The Bible comes alive. Revelation came alive. The veil came down. So we all went and bought the biggest Bibles we could find. There's four of us, all bit seniors. And they were called Dake's Annotated Reference Bible, little, little suitcases. They were that big. And we walked in our high school the first year, and it was the most fun I ever had. I was so intimidated by all these football jocks and all this stuff. But do you know when I came down, when I was walking by myself down the breezeway, I saw these big 200 and something pound jocks. When they saw me, they took off running the other way. And I would just laugh. And you know what I'd say? Jesus loves you. And we preached everywhere. Anywhere and everywhere. You know, Magnolia was a dry county, so we took off and went to Spring Hill, Louisiana, where there was one bar after another. One of us was 21 years old. There was a guy. So he would go in the bars and bring them out. And we had a, a policeman pull up to me. And, and, and so what we did, we stood at the traffic light, this big traffic light, cars, kids, just line it up. And so at every traffic light, me and this other guy would walk up to the window, and of course they'd roll it down, and we'd say, hey man, can we tell you how much Jesus loves you? All of you, the Lord wants to save you, and if you'll just pull right into this parking lot, we'll tell you all about it. We had over, uh, tell me, 150 kids in this parking lot. And so one of them got up on top of the car, started preaching, and I'll never forget this. And a young man came over and laid, tapped me on the shoulder. He said, can, can I talk to you? And I got him in my car. And I said, what's going on? And he st- big old tears started running down his eyes. He said, I'm away from God. I know what you guys are teaching is true. Just cry. He said, and I know God sent y'all here for me. And he said, I need, I need to be born again. I need Jesus in my life. I was like, whoo, shika mo shy, man. Glory to God. I said, grab my hand. Let's pray. Man, I'm telling you, that young man broke, was weeping. And the, the presence of Jesus entered my car and he got gloriously born again. And there was a spirit of boldness that comes. That comes from the thrusting. But it also comes from you knowing your authority. I'll close this up real quick, but I want you to listen to this. Mike invited me to a village. And 
we, I don't know how many hours it took, six to eight hours, is that correct? Get out borderline, border of Tanzania and Uganda for three days in the middle of the bush. It wasn't the end of the world, but it was certainly visible from there. And we went out there to minister for three days. The minute we get there, the pastor starts telling us all the problem they're having. It's with a witch doctor. And the witch doctor was a lady. And uh, so we, Mike and I both said, well, let's go see her. We might as well get this over with. So we went. Here was a hut. And she came out. Now her eyes were as, looking at her eyes were as white as snow. She's blind. But she brought the Koran. And she began to tell through the interpreter that she could read the Koran. But that's all that she could read. And she was keeping that village in bondage through witchcraft and through all kinds of stuff. Well, Mike and I both, which he's a lot better at it than I am. He dealt with it all the time. But I was like, oh, this is cool. I mean, I, I really did. I thought this is going to be so fun. So we just started smiling real big, started talking to her about Jesus. She, her whole countenance changed, didn't it, Mike? Her countenance fell. She ran in that tent. So you know what Mike and I did? We just stood over that tent and said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, we bind every spirit of witchcraft over this village and your days are over in the name of Jesus. We take full authority while we're here. This will never happen. We bound that spirit. We bind that spirit. You get out of this place and you will not hinder anymore. I didn't know till later until Mike told me that woman can never read the Koran again. Mike and I go into her little hut that she had. Every kind of little witchcraft ornament you could imagine. And we walked in there and we just said we take full authority in the name of Jesus. And I was walking out, and this is the truth. She had all kind of sharp objects. I actually caught my pants legs. Blue jeans caught it. And it ripped my pants and, and Mike reminded me, and I just said, well, devil, you can rip my pants, but you can't touch me. <laughs> so we walk around the hut, and we came face to face with that woman's son. I don't know how old he was, probably 16 years old. His eyes got as big, I'm telling you, as saucers. When he saw us, I have never witnessed in my life. He turned and he began to run. And I, I've never seen, like a gazelle. He was running so fast, he jumps a six foot, seven foot fence in stride. We discovered later on, he ran for three full days. We went into, we, Mike took me into one village where people were just burning up with fever. And they just lined up. We didn't even think about hand cleansers. Because we were under God's authority. Who had time to think about that? Who had time to even think about what kind of disease? Jesus didn't tell the apostles, now when you lay hands on cast out these diseases, make sure you clean your hands first. Now, make sure you got a mask on. Are y'all getting where I'm going with this? Jesus did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Now, I'm not being cruel and mean and ugly. I, I, where I'm cautious. I wear a mask everywhere else. But you know what we need is a revelation of his authority that we have in our lives. We laid hands on people who were, because of this, this sickness, the fever had broken out, and I'm t they, were, they were smoking, and we laid hands in the name of Jesus. And I don't remember how long it took, but we were about 
two miles from where we were at, and it was pitch black, walking through an African jungle, and you could see nothing going back. The guy had a white T-shirt, and I would grab him and walk like this. And, of course, Mike's just laughing at me. And I said, well, if something in that jungle jumps out and grabs me, I'm cutting your support off. But we laughed, and we made it. It's about authority. Everything changes when it's, when it's authority. Everything changes. I love Tim and Liana. They invite me over at their house. We've known each other for years. But you know, when I walk into their house, I don't go sit in Tim's chair. You know why? Because I'm under authority. I'm no longer in authority. I'm under authority. He carries the authority. I don't look at them and go, oh, I'm going to go to your bed and lay down. They're going to say, now, Pat, now he's a good friend, so he's going to say, Terry, now I love you, but you're not going to my bedroom. <laughs> so it's all about what? All about authority. So are we under the authority of some sickness and disease? Or do we have authority in the name of Jesus. Are we going to sing a beautiful song. About his name is glory. His name is above everything. And just walk out and go. Is that a beautiful song? No, no, no. That's not just a beautiful song. That's a revelation. In the name of Jesus. Satan. You cannot have my children. Satan. You will not. You will not take my health. You cannot. You will not drive me into fear. I'm going to be thankful for the job that I have and I take full authority over, over the nonsense or whatever and I put and I release in the spirit, I release the power of God and the love of God. And you don't go in there. I don't go into a restaurant speaking in tongues. No, but I listen. I'll, and I don't witness to every waiter or waitress. But there are days that I know, and I pull them over. I said, now I'm going to bless you with a good tip. Before I do, I want to tell you how much Jesus Christ loves you. Is there anything I can pray for you about? The thrust. You'll never be thrusted without understanding authority. Authority in Christ. I respect those, believe me, and I do. I respect those who feel that they, they have to be cautious. Look, I'm at the age I shouldn't be here. That's what they tell me. But what I'm telling you is this right here. Let's get in the Bible and let's let that be our authority. Amen. Respect people, love people. And I'm not going to get up and condemn people. No, that's not what it's about. But I want everybody to listen to me. If it's not COVID-19, it's going to be COVID-20. It's going to be COVID-21, COVID-22, COVID-23. They'll give it a new name, which is not written down in glory. And, it, and it's just all these different things. And we live in fear. You know why? Because the devil's doing everything he can to keep the church out of the harvest. And this is where we have to look. Because revival is going to thrust you into the harvest. It's going to thrust you into the school, your workplace. And it's not anything but a boldness. Man, boldness. I spent so, every Friday night, I was on a parking lot my senior year. Telling people about Jesus. Every Friday night. That was the joy. I mean, people, kids were getting saved left and right. We had more fun. Oh, I'm telling you, I had a blast my senior year in school. Because you know what? I got a revelation. I am seated with Jesus in heavenly places. I want to pray for those who are watching right now in the name of Jesus. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, now is the time to receive him as Lord. He loves you so much. His power is here to break every, 
everything in your life and set you free. All you have to do is call upon him and say, Jesus, come into my life. I believe in you and I receive it. If you've got sickness in your body, you've got things in your, in your body, in your life right now. Just in the name of Jesus, begin to declare his name over that. And I speak healing and health. And I curse that spirit of COVID over you in Jesus' name. That disease has to bow in the name of Jesus. No matter where it came from, it still came from hell. It didn't come. It didn't originate in God. It is not God's will. And we thank God for the blood of Jesus that covers you. And that river of life is flowing through you to heal you, to deliver you, and to set you free. That spirit of oppression and that spirit of depression is broken off of your mind in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stand up with me. Mark, bring the lights down. I want our elders to come. Hallelujah. Thank